um, with the presentation. Um, so just to give a quick overview as to what the festival is, for people who don't know about the Walking Festival of Sound, the Walking Festival of Sound is a transdisciplinary event exploring the role of walking through and listening to our everyday surroundings. It combines a number of free and public events, including walking performances, walking seminars, listening sessions, all taking place in diverse public spaces and online. The Walking Festival of Sound facilitates a meeting point for an international network of practitioners and researchers interested in sound and walking. Through diverse events, we explore how walking and listening practices can augment and challenge the way we perceive, navigate through, and care for our shared environments. In 2022, the Walking Festival of Sound will take place in multiple places, and we will announce the details of this as soon as we can. So that's enough from me. Thanks everyone again for coming. I'm going to pass over to Jacek now, who will introduce our guest artist for this evening. Thank you, Tim. Uh, hi, everyone. So it's my uh, great pleasure to welcome uh, tonight uh, Christel Lundahl and Martina Seidel, uh, who are pioneers of uh, new immersive anti-disciplinary practice within contemporary art and performance. In their work, simulated realities are left incomplete with triggers and nudges that activate the visitor's ability to create independent meaning from a web of mental and physical objects. <clears throat> Notions of freedom, autonomy, and what is real, imagined, and perceived are negotiated by the visitors themselves in philosophical investigations of boundaries and connections between the living objects, places, and environments. Lundal and Seitel's work or works and projects have been exhibited worldwide, including, but limited, not limited to Tate Britain, Whitechapel Galler Gallery, Martin Gropius, uh, Berliner Festspiele, Hamburger Kunsthalle, Avignon Festival, Mon uh, Momentum 8, Tunnel Vision, Nordic Biennial of Contemporary Art, among others. And I guess we will hear more about those different places that uh, Christer and Martina has visited over the years. Uh, so uh, please welcome Lundal and Seitel. Mm. Thank you very much. Thank you for um, inviting us. And uh, uh, we are very happy to share this with you. And um, just to kind of say that uh, it's a nice evening here in Stockholm. And um, uh, this is also our home and uh, our family home. So you might see behind the scenes kind of our family popping in and out in kind of different ways <laughs> throughout uh, this, just so you know. But yeah, let's just uh, uh, dive straight into it then. Yeah, we thought that we should give a presentation of our um, earlier works. Um, they have varied quite a lot throughout the years, um, uh, but having one center in, in sound and also movement, I would say. And I think also, it, I think in the, throughout the presentation, I will try to make a point of movement being the connection point to the walking festival in our practice. And um, so I will go over to share screen mode here. Uh, let's see, going here. Mama. <laughs> Mama. Uh, let's see. No, Martina disappeared with our seven year old, but I will start this by myself, I was thinking. So let's see. So I will start. And by the way, um, would we have questions throughout? Is that a good idea? Or do you think it's better that by we as percent and we take questions after? Yes, I think that's a better idea to uh, leave quick Q&A to, towards the end. But if yeah. anyone has a question or a thought that would like to save, the, please put it on the chat just to keep it keep it in mind. I, we are not that many, so I think we'll just allow people to pose questions directly after the uh, the presentation. Okay, I'm just going to take the sun down a little bit because it's too intense. To get a sense of liveness to this program. 
I like right. how you're already working with augmenting reality uh, out Absolutely. there. Absolutely. <laughs> I, I always think that like, if you sort of have a sense of uh, the space where, where if someone does this, for example, you have a sense of where someone is, right? Like you yeah, have a, some place towards where we are. Okay, great. Uh, so I think it's, so what we're going to focus on is uh, mainly, as Chris has said, uh, the body and movement and sound and how they uh, two can be connected. And we're going to give different examples of our work and what it actually means to include the moving body into the experience. Yeah, and, and uh, so what we have here before where we made this uh, sketch of this pr uh, presentation, we had two, uh, in a way, um, thoughts that we thought that we should sort of start with uh, giving you before we started to talk about the works. First one is um, this statement of that the virtual is not only a form of technology, it's also the ability to receive a world. Second one is that walking and movement as a way for bodies to negotiate between virtual and physical space. This is uh, when we move our, when we move, we come back into our body somewhat. Um, and um, yeah, this is something that I think we're gonna try to connect in this presentation. And before we go any further, we would also like to just give you a brief background about how we came to work together and where we come from. So I have a choreographic background and then I later came into the visual arts. Uh, Krista has a background in the visual arts uh, and we started to work together in 2000 and when was Five. it? Also. Wow, so a long time ago. Okay, so 2005. So when we started to work together, we uh, started to merge our practices and then it became something totally different and nobody really expected it to become what it is even today. And I think still, I think we are one of those artists that doesn't just find a medium and then stick with that medium. We seem to be kind of in a both good and I guess bad way as well, that we, we find a medium and then we start to kind of exploring other mediums all the time. And we have almost this curse over ourselves where we always uh, find ourselves trying to reinvent the medium itself. And then we find ourselves in completely difficult and sometimes impossible technical difficulties in, when we do that. So we're, but we will give you some examples of that a bit later on. But it's specifically more in our tech heavy project like our virtual reality. We have some projects that are virtual reality collective mm. projects. Uh, but we might give some examples of that later on. Yeah. But we will start very early. Yeah, let, in... yeah let's say that this project, Symphony of a Missing Room, was a type of work where we didn't exactly work with technology as such. I mean, we have three-dimensional three sound, binaural sound and headphones. We have this sightless goggles, which you don't see anything in them, but only you see light and shadows. Um, but still, uh, even so, you sort of because of the nature of the work uh, that is rooted in choreography that we are in a way instructing the visitors to, to walk and move through space and also oftentimes led by a performer. There is a um, kind of um, almost like a virtual reality that is happening or that is played out in, in the mind or body of the visitors that, of this work because they are responding to those triggers of the work and they connect the, the parts that is missing and they weave it into some kind of world that, that they are part of themselves to produce in a way. Yeah, exactly. And, um, and, and when, when, when we gradually, when we know we're gonna present, we're gonna go into works that is more and more engaging with technology. And we realizing that this is not technology in the sense that the technology that should, should provide a new medium for us making work is also us to make work that's in a way looking at the friction that technology creates. Because sometimes, I mean, the virtual reality might be even stronger in those kind of works, the earlier works where it have not much technology and they're actually being lessened by the technology of the more heavy, more like a virtual reality goggles. Yes, yeah, so it's almost like Chris has said, we're using the intersection between the human imagination and the sound as triggering, and then together with the movement of, we call them the visitors, their body through space. So it's almost like, because these works, uh, Symphony of a Missing Room, they're always site specific. So it always starts with us coming and visiting a museum and we record the sound binarily on site so that when people are later experiencing the work, uh, they start to blur the sounds that are recorded, but the sounds that are actually there 
on mm. site as well. But then there is also moments where they get, as you see now, we call it whiteout goals, which is not VR goggles, but these are actually re reducing, we are removing one's, uh, one's sense. And, uh, and they can only perceive light and shadow in these. So in that way, it often triggers the imagination of the visitor. So when we give a sound, like let's say we give the sound of the uh, an architectural space that is very large, or we give a, a, a sound of a space of a tunnel that is very small, it can trigger memories that you have of a small tunnel or a big space. Yeah, and uh, we're gonna now look at a clip from uh, Kochi Masiris Biennial in India, uh, where Symphony was um, adapted for this place and it was showing for three months actually. And I think about over 7,000 people came into this work, which was quite extraordinary for us to have that large group of people. Um, and as you see, people will be moving with this goggles, being guided. And in a sense, because that they are moving and putting themselves into position together with a three-dimensional sound, they somehow uh, weave, um, what do you call it in neurology, like a multisensory binding, uh, where you create sort of a, a coherent reality of things that is actually not there. Listen to my voice. Close your eyes now. Kidilan mm. experience in Kibida and Binale Vanadilla. It was a beautifully guided uh, virtual reality experience. Chuttuola, only ne, namke kannu onda neerite gana vachila. Pashe namke thani bhavi charya vachu. I actually felt that I was not here in this space, you know, I was not here, I was taken away into a completely new dimension. experience. I've never had these kind of emotions and sensations kind of aroused. It's absolutely mind-blowing. For me what was really beautiful was not only the idea uh, and the execution but the way it was actually done. It was beautiful because it demanded trust. So what you also saw in this little film was that people started to actually gather around the people that were experiencing the work. So some people also kind of saw the performative aspect of uh, people experiencing the work from the outside. And what you can see when you look at it from the outside is you might have seen that some people bend down or they're being pulled through. Um, so they might, for example, hear the sound of uh, walking through a wall, or they might be given an instruction to bend their head down because they're going to go through a smaller passage. Um, and, uh, and some of them experience that they are, they are inside a forest. Kristen, well. Martina and Kristen, I'm sorry for breaking your flow. Uh, I just realized that there is a, there's a little bit of a glitch uh, on your screen, like when you shared your screen, a couple of additional windows popped up and I'm not sure if everyone sees them. I know that Tim can see them. So I wonder if you can just reshare your screen and see if they, this glitch yeah. is 
could disappear. Oh, okay. So you don't yeah. see. Uh, I mean, I, no, no. I mean, we we see almost everything, but there is like a little uh, strip basically uh, mm -hmm. on top. And okay, I think let's try. Let's try. I stop sharing, and I'm gonna reshare it. Um, you can try to reshare just the presentation, not not the desktop, uh, not the entire desktop, and I think that that should work. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yes. 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 So uh, here, for example, I would do that, right? And um... and you did see the film, right? Yeah, we did see the film, but but just on top of your screen, for some reason, there are like uh, little windows. Uh, okay. Popping up. And do you see us when we present it? Yeah, yeah we, we we see you. We see, it, it's almost perfect. It's just that. Yeah, 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 yeah. It can be even better. <laughs> okay, sure. Uh, okay, let's. Uh, so, is it? Um, and do you still see it? The windows now? Uh, yeah, I, I can still see. I don't know if any, everyone else sees them. Maybe it's just on my side. Yeah, there are three gray screens at, uh, on the top. C Kathleen is also saying. Sometimes I found that if you turn, like, uh, if you have anything on your desktop that's open, any other screens to close them, even though that you're not sharing them, sometimes they show up. Okay. Um, let's. Um, I can do that. Oh, that's the see. Gray one behind this one. Oh, that's the Zoom link. Yeah. Yeah, it but, might be it might be the, the like different windows from Zoom actually because I noticed that there was a. Okay. Uh, um, let's see. Like name I, of... So I, I um, maybe I can take optimize for video clip because that might also disturb. Um, let's see. Is that, that? I wouldn't worry about it too much. It, it's okay. Yeah. It's just it's been stripped. Now it's perfect. Yeah. Is that there? Oh, yeah. yeah. It was right. the optimizing for video clip that was the thing, yeah, I think. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. fantastic. Sorry again for, for breaking no, no, it's good. It's good, it's good that you say. I talked all the time and didn't know. <laughs> and you see us when we present now, do you? Yes. Okay, nice. Oh, perfect. So what you see in the image now is from the Momentum Biannual uh, in Norway. And we, came, we always come and experience the work site specifically. Uh, and that's how uh, we do, and we record it. We record the sound on site. And this is where you saw before. Uh, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to talk too much about the different places. We have basically been with this piece in about I don't know over twenty places around the globe, um, and it has been very interesting because all of those places are really showing art in different ways. There's different expectations of how art should be presented and what you can experience in those places. Um, so in a, in, throughout the years with this work, we have realized that this artwork became an artwork that collected museums. Um, uh, because in the end, what we did was that we created a version which was not bound to a physical space of a museum, but it was more rather um, a uh, assemblage of the different museums that we had been visiting. Um, so you could walk from one museum into another and then different layers. But it was not only the architecture of those museums that was interesting to us, it was also, in a sense, the sort of learnings that we had when we came in, the sort of like narrative in a way of the places where we came to that was then transferred into the artwork itself. Um, yeah. Uh, of course, the architecture informs a lot the type of walks that we do. Uh, and, and it also, in the end, and of course, also informs the type of um, choreography and of what, what the art or the experience of the art will be. And also something that is interesting to think about um, when moving through an artwork versus actually being seated is that you take in information in a different way. And all, uh, very often in the process, we find ourselves that when we, we write in a lot of kind of ideas and concepts into it, and then in the end, we find ourselves having to reduce the script massively, because when your body is moving in three-dimensional space, there's just an, um, a particular amount of uh, information that you can take in, actually, uh, which, we, versus, which is very different than when you sit down. It's almost like different rules. And I always, I'm always so disappointed having to cut away a lot of interesting ideas that just simply doesn't work because people are moving through space. Yeah. This is at Martin Grupis Bau. And one element which I, is particularly interesting to this place, Martin Grupis Bau in Berlin, Germany, is that um, even though we are 
interested in the place and the history of a of, of a space, it, it doesn't mean that we take it in explicitly into the piece that we explicitly say that that tell that narrative in the piece. For example, in here at the Gruppiusbau, uh, the story about Gruppiusbau being the headquarters for the Nazis during the Second World War was not mentioned in the piece, but it was um, a story. We were commissioning. A, a, um, uh, a story uh, or, or like a, the text or exhibition text, actually a, a, a common friend of ours, Ronald Jones wrote this text uh, about Kette Niederkirchner, um, uh, who was the leader of the communist party and also were killed by the Nazis. Um, so th this story is circulated around that, but it also go into the fact that the, the building of Martin Gruppesbau had stood after the war, it was stood empty for 25, 30 years before it was then reused again. It was so like overgrown by, by even trees inside, I think. Um, mm. So it was sort of interesting, even though there was nothing was explicitly mentioned in the piece, people that had read the text before entering the piece then had that with them when they, when they in a way, um, so, so, so those architectural spaces that you were, you know, uh, immersed in, let's say, inside the piece, it was then, and it could be like almost like an, in a sense, filled with the sort of narrative that they have had before, even though something was not said to you when you yeah. when you experienced it. It's in a way, Chris is saying something similar to what I mentioned before about how to take in information in that state. Uh, so that the, it was maybe solved by being given a text that you read before, and then when you enter it, you kind of you immerse. And one another factor is, of course, that you see in this image is the hand. Uh, that's another dimension to the work that you have this communication with an unseen guide that you actually never seen, and you might not ever know who was guiding you. And you have to develop a relationship with this hand through tiny little cues of. Um, I mean, the, the guide is very, they're very trained. I mean, they are, have a, normally they're dancers, so they have a choreographic score that is very extremely set, but at the same time, it's also open because the unpredictable factor is the visitor and we need to be able to respond to everyone that comes in. So if someone is scared or if someone holds back or someone is very moving a lot, uh, so it's an open, in that way, it's, um, we have to be open about the choreography. Mm. And that's another kind of unknown factor. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we will also not talk so much about this piece, but we can say that it was a commission, a solo exhibition actually in Bonn Kunstmuseum in Germany, uh, where we um, we were able to go and um, see what artworks they had in the collection, and we could we could select and curate artworks that we were interested in. Um, and what we did was that we did, we, we chose uh, three or four works and we, uh, we placed them in one of the galleries. Um, and then in the, so that was in one of the wings, so the, the outer galleries. And so one work was original artwork from the collection. The second outer wing was uh, copies that we made of these artworks. And in the middle room, it was empty. So you were looking at the works in the first room and then were giving this kind of whiteout goggles and, and also um, a sound track or with instructions with the choreography that you were then asked to um, recreate or to uh, embody these artworks as experience from have being an object in, in one room, then you were asked to embody them with uh, and, and, and into an experience. So this was one room. That's another room. These are not the same rooms. Because I don't normally think. when you come to see an exhibition, it is not that uh, steered because it's really a choreography on how you perceive the artworks, which artwork you start with and end with, and how you also transcribe them into a memory. That is, uh, so you, it's in a way that the first experience is visual and then uh, your vision is totally removed and you have to uh, remember them in sound and in memory, and we worked uh, together with a sound artist, uh, David Östberg, uh, that helped us transcribe the artworks uh, into sound. So one of the sounds that you hear now in the track is a sound that he transcribed 
on one of the paintings, a painting actually by Max Ernst, they made into sound. They were first of all following these text messages in the beginning. So in one way, we didn't want to give them the sound before they entered the room, because that would somehow take away the impact of the sound later. had no clue what where they're going to end up because a lot of people just walked in and thought it was a normal exhibition with an audit gout without realizing that they were going to be goggled up and this uh, was actually a lost visitor oh okay i'm here now turn away from the wall so that you're facing the room. Turn away from the wall. You need to let go of the world of objects. Good. Yeah, so this is inside the room where they were transcribing their memory of the visual artwork okay. into their body inside. There seems to be an opening somewhere. And the mobile suddenly become, from becoming a mobile from device, they are only a light source the that sound. they are putting inside the goggles. Follow the sound with your mind and you will find a way out. So they could actually experience it with their eyes closed. It was just about the rhythm of the sound, but also the rhythm of the light. You didn't have to the opening it. is above you. Look up. Yes. Wait. Your perspective has changed. You have entered the light of the lighthouse. There's, uh, there's a At the top the of the mountain. Overlooking the sea. You have become the light itself that creates the image. But it can also be the force that breaks the image apart. Yeah, it's quite hard to <laughs> um, show this kind of work in this way, but I think you maybe have an idea of it. Um, the, the, the last um, passage where you sort of have this light and, and the shifting light was where you were sort of inside the cave, one of the cave, because it was one of the Dolomite mountains, the scul big sculptures that we saw. They were, uh, you were inside a cave, inside one of those, um, and then came out to the, to the surface in the end. Um, all right, so we have gone from Symphony, which was the first work, where we had a performer leading single visitors and came to this uh, um, work uh, in the new originals where you're using the technique that we had in the first work but then to relate to objects and then objects disappearing into experience and then this one in evolution you have uh, instead of two uh, one visitor and a performer guiding them you have two visitors following instructions in the choreography um which is a piece that we made for um the, the Uppsala Kunst Museum they actually acquired this work which is in itself something quite spectacular because it's a very hard for a museum but at least they think it's a very hard thing for a museum to own a, a piece like this to, to to keep it throughout the years and to be able to take it up and, and to show it and uh, I, I I think it's it um it might prove that it is not so hard. In fact, it's just so that uh, the museum has um, are shown ways to do it basically from us as artists. We have to show them that this is possible to, to, to acquire this type of work. So what you have here is um, two visitors 
following instructions. They have, each of them have a belt, which is a vibration belt that is corresponding to the sound that they hear. And there is a screen with a speed reading text, which is only seen by one of the performers and also other visitors that is in the exhibition room at that time. And one of the visitors, the one that has um, goggles that you will later on see here, that face. Um, it's almost like reverse virtual reality. Yeah, this is what this was the idea that we wanted to create um, a rever in a in a way using the it's, it's the same virtual reality technology that you have uh, you know to create VR pieces. You have the tracking, you have you have the um, the game engine, you know, tracking and playing out of it. But in here, instead, you only see the shadows of that space. Uh, but you are present in the sound and you are present in uh, in the movement and in the body, in the touch from the other visitor, basically. Um, and, it's, and you need, it's almost like uh, he is the extension of her eyes because in order for her to understand what he sees, she needs to move him because that's how she sees the shadows of mm. his world. Mm. Um, so... And we were inspired by Peter Weiss' novel, The Aesthetics of Resistance, uh, for this work as well. Because Peter Weiss has also works at Uppsala Kunstmuseum. Yeah, that's right. And, and um, so Aesthetics of Resistance. Um, so thinking about how resistance, if in a physical way, what it means to, to re resist something, but also in a, within a given structure. So within this artwork, the way you could resist is to, instead of, um, because if both of them have the instructions of, of, of resisting the other or like giving weight away from the other. And what they hear, because and then hinting towards the program on freeze, which was the, and made by slaves and by dragging heavy stones and to, to make this artwork you in a way you're becoming a stone uh, the, the person with the goggles are uh, heavy as a stone but also you have this vibration in the belt and the sound of being a, a big stone being being dragged over the floor um, and 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 the piece is called involution and the, this this sense of this sort of like in, Darv in Darv Darwinian biology is this sense of like a competition, uh, but there is also in biology, in fact, also a, a level of um, participation and, and, and involvement that species have with other species. So here you really have to participate or collaborate with each other uh, and, and to share each other's sensory uh, limitations in order to be able to experience the artwork. But you also get, uh opposite instructions so one gets like an instruction to guide the other but the other one is asked to resist her uh, and in that way they in a way the two people almost come to stand still so there is a moment where both are kind of using their weights and leaning back until they find almost like an like here an equilibrium and then one could ask like if they're both resisting resistance is not resistance anymore it's actually the letting go becomes a true way of resisting that so i guess we ask the question like when is the right time to resist and who is it that resists and here you will see very soon krista will show um, an example of the shadows that are being moved by the visitor's body of the wall so it's almost like being seen as if looking at the pergamon frieze through a prehistoric eye this was the idea, yeah. Yeah, that was the idea for for the shadows. And uh, on the wall, there was also in the in the sort of intermission when there was no one experiencing the work, there was the rec the re uh, movement data from their uh, moving in the room that was then like a shadow coming over the sculptures. Yeah. I'm keeping track of time here. I think we yeah, are need yes, to move on. Let's go move on. <laughs> we are now. That's okay because we started a bit later, yeah. so we can. Yeah. Okay. And uh, so we're moving on to a uh, the first time we actually worked with uh, virtual reality. We've been resisting that for a long time actually to work uh, visually because we used to write out goggles for a long time, and believed a lot in the human own capacity to imagine things without needing VR. But then we met ScanLab projects in the UK, London based, and uh, they work with uh, three dimensional architectural scannings. But you can reduce those scannings to the bare minimum. 
it's like making them into tiny point clouds where you can still uh, use absences in the in those visuals. This is the um, it's an installation called Eterno Return, and what we did is that we used uh, we were scanning uh, Steinwen's Sons Piano Factory in London, and we were then uh, printing it out through three D in fragments back into the physical space again, and the visitor were kind of so they were seeing the spaces, but then they could also touch some parts of the spaces. So what you see to the very left is a, a door that separates a piano player from a different room. Uh, it's a soundproof door. So you can see almost like a sound studio material. And the one at the very front is a piano tuners workshop with a reversed hammer uh, on top of it. So mm. oh, you see the negative shape of a hammer, mm. a piano tuners tool. Mm. So there is nothing given uh, in this virtual space. Everything is uh, created in a sense of the visitor being there. So um, um, even you, okay, so you see a hammer laying on the uh, workbench and you're asked to pick it up and, and you, you're, 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 you're experiencing that you only have the negative space, you don't feel the hammer. So there is a sense of like a friction there between what you see and what you feel, it's like the, this different sort of like sensory input. Um, so it's, um, and I, I think that's sort of something, and then you're becoming aware of the medium, you are inside virtual reality. You, you, in, one, on, in one way you feel present, but in another way you're totally absent. There is something wrong there in terms of the sensory space you are so in. It's really a lot about the friction between the virtual and then the physical space that you're in. But also with the sound, I think we have to work with a different, because when we were showing you earlier Symphony of a Missing Room uh, with the white hat goggles, we were working binarily with the sound. So if you move your head, the sound comes with you. But in a virtual um, In a world, game engine. In a game, yeah, exactly. In a game engine, it's a bit different. So we people were always advising us oh you have to use spatialized sound and we did for example if you found a piano you could kind of touch your hand through the piano and they will make a sound at that particular place but then at the same time we had to mix it with the binaural it was only with spatial sound it didn't work so we had to find kind of a balance between the two different methods of sound the the image you see on the right is actually um uh, it's kind of the piano workshop itself unfolding through a um, tiny coffee cup. So it's almost like a whole space unfolding around you. And then when that unfolds, it's a particular sound, which is binaural. <laughs> but when you move inside the space that has unfolded, it's a spatialized sound. Yeah. Um, well, we can show a little bit, just at least you sort of miss this sort of like the philosophical part of it because you get so sort of like small chunks of it. Uh, so it's really hard. I show you only this thing because this is the guiding principle in the dark space. In the universe, and, um might happen with no one there to remember it. And I just stop there and say that this um, guiding principle, I mean, you saw that someone was holding something in the hand there, and that is a stromatolite. Uh, and that was the only natural, like a geological object that we had in this piece. Um, so it's basically a um, I think this one is a 27 million year old um, stromatolite fossil of cyanobacteria, uh, and we were interested in that being one of the first type of memories or like traces of, of, of something that have happened on Earth that was stored, because this whole piece somehow turned out to be uh, like almost like a memory archive. And um, also to say that the performer is holding a tracker, this is what you see. Like you see that uh, what Chris is holding in the image, it's like a tracker. And that is seen as a moving cluster of points for the person in VR. So there's a live element inside the kind of quite pre-record or preset structure. Yeah, let's see now here, this is all the objects. Um, realizing that this, this um, I have too many images in this presentation. This is the stromatolite. And we have to jump over the garden, I think. I think we have to jump over. It's our, anyway, while Chris, uh, Chris is flicking through, it's our latest, most complex collective VR project. Uh, we made a first um, prototype recently in STRP Eindhoven. And it's really, truly an experiment that is uh, ongoing. 
but we want to end up here. That's right. So now we are here at the Streetlight Harvesters, and I hopefully it was a good idea to that to, to go through all of this work because it maybe shows um, it's not that we're ending up here that this would be an endpoint, but I think okay. at least that. Uh, this is a artwork that happens in public space and outdoors. Um, it comes from another work called Unknown, Unknown Cloud, which um, we have been working on for, for some time now, almost 10 years, I think. And it will go on until 2057 because it's extremely difficult. Uh, it's, we find it, it, it's a work, it's an app artwork that happens on people's devices. Uh, and that is always extremely difficult because um, to get it work on other people's devices and also to kind of experiment with really different ways of uh, working with sound. Um, but, it, but not only that, also how to make it a collective experience. So it's extremely challenging. And uh, every time we do it, it feels different. So it's, it's hard to kind of push the project forward artistically. But one thing that we do is uh, it's a collaboration together with Untold Garden. Uh, is Max Scheller and Jakob Skøtte. And they work with uh, AR, augmented reality, but not visually. Uh, it's uh, augmented reality in sound, which means that you can, for example, find a, a sculpture uh, in midair, or let's say, or you can say like a cell. A, a membrane. Or, or a membrane. In, in this case, it's a membrane. Membrane of sound, and you can trace it around. This is very clear where it ends and where it begins if you have AR but only used as a sound experience. Yeah, so you can basically have like a surface which vibrates when you push your, the, the, the phone through it. Uh, and it could also activate, for example, uh, some lights from, from the screen, for example. And uh, so why would li one like to do that? And what, what is our purpose of doing that? Um, it's, um, I mean, it sort of comes in this sort of like, it's a lineage of our work that is going, working to, with technology and, and also like in the friction of technology. So uh, technology in this sense becomes something that can, you know, we, in with technology, you get more control in one way because you can, you can, you can set things in time, putting people through an experience in time. But you can do that with choreography and instructions yeah. too. So, but what this technology can do is that it can connect people's instructions together with uh, other visitors, but mostly it can sort of like trace things in space. I think that the, the tracking technology is and something that's so is... difficult is that uh, both for this particular project, Unknown Cloud and the Streetlight Harvest is a little bit different, but and uh, the previous one, Garden of Ghost Flower, is that you're not meant to do this with the technology itself. So, for example, with um, virtual reality headsets, now I'm talking about a pre, now I'm jumping a bit, talking about a previous project, you're not meant to have a collective experience with uh, virtual reality headsets. They're meant to be on your own in the metaverse. So that's why so so until God and had to hack into the headsets in order to be able to kind of even do something like that. And it's quite similar for to make a group of, experience make, in yeah. the same space to align. Uh, so you're looking at one digital object, but everyone else in the space sees that from their own position, right? Exactly. And, and this is what is so really hard. And then you're also cre a creator of different aspects of, of the work. But but it's almost one could say that uh, it's uh, unknown cloud is like a group experience that if we started it as a mythology about a cloud that cannot be seen um, physically, but it, it, that it passes perhaps your location at a particular moment. It's almost like a solar eclipse where you have to be at that particular moment in time in order to be able to experience it and you experience it collectively. But Streetlight Harvesters is an um, ev yeah, evolution of that project, but it's something that is experienced on, um, on your own, but Streetlight Harvesters and Unknown Cloud can be actually connected because one is charging the other. Yeah, so, yeah. It's me and a streetlight when we are testing this thing. Um, and I'm wondering, I think before we're showing you like a short video, how it looks like it is, is maybe we should, um, we can show the video actually, because I think you tell the story about oh, it in yeah. the video. I think we tell it in the video. And it's also um, um, not to forget to say that this is a project we haven't created yet. This is just um, yeah. in a way, uh, a way for us to summon our ideas and, and to, 
yeah, we are now hoping to be able to make this for Skeppsholmen in, in Stockholm, Sweden. Uh, and we are just now trying to get everything, uh, yeah, uh, like the, 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 the funding and so on together to do that. Um, hopefully we can show it next year in, 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 uh, in early spring. Like in a, like you yeah. know like because it has to, one thing to say about this project is that it's um, uh, it is important that it happens in the transition between night and day and it's also important that it happens in the transition between um, or, um, you know summer to autumn and and winter to spring so those kind of transitional periods um, but let's see let I play it now oh. I don't see anything, right? Your device. There's no video, right? Can you see no. no, no video, just a gray screen. Oh, why is it that? Now, let's try like this. Oh, yeah. Yeah, now it works. So it will be a bit like this, but um, and now at least we see it. Me here. Look, can good here. Device. Hand. Look, look at your device. Device. Look at the device hand. that you hold in your hand. It is now tuned to a frequency which will allow you to see things you normally cannot. Use it as if it was an extension of your senses. In a series of invisible sound sculptures, this project appropriates the city streetlights in the form of a monstrous creature, conceived from a lineage of human control of the visible light spectrum from fire and oil lanterns to the gas lights of the 19th century and today's electrical LED lights. The project focuses on light as a measure and impact of human technological presence across the air disrupting the life of animals, in particular bees, moths and bats, and migratory birds, but also some insect populations. These animals use the senses in a radically different way than humans do. Interesting paradox with the streetlight assemblage, and what we are excited to explore, is how the personal and intimate encounter with the more than human via the individual visitor's body spreads into the infrastructure of the city by controlling its light. At the advent of the endemic, we want to focus on bringing art back into people's lives through the consideration of our human umwelt, how it connects us and how it disconnects us from each other and other life forms and processes. With the Artworks app downloaded and open on their smartphone, the visitors locate the body of the creature through a map showing where and which streetlights are in her possession. As the visitor approaches closer to a streetlight in possession, the light bulb starts to become visibly affected. It has become destabilized and starts to flicker in rhythm with a three-dimensional sound composition that the visitor hears in headphones. The light bulb eventually goes off and seems to instead be transmitted into their device and inviting the visitor to experience darkness. Visitors then have an opportunity to explore the limits of their spectrum of perceivable reality as well as expanding their life world into more than human forms of life. A voice in headphones guides the visitor to look for invisible formations in the area around the streetlights. The visitor keeps searching for invisible formations around them, above them, and within themselves, the visitor might discover a spherical, slightly oval cluster of forms. They can hear and feel the membranes through a slight characteristic vibration as they make a first contact with its invisible surface. Some formations contain several membranes of sound and they might hold a nucleus of mute vibrations within itself. And some formations are attached to the ground and some are hovering above their head or settling itself inside a nearby tree. The visitor is carefully tracing the outer edges of the invisible structures in midair using their devices. When the visitor moves their body 
and their device, it makes a sound that they can hear in their headphones. They can hear their own movements as if moving through a liquid substance. With time, the searching hand of the visitor might be mistaken for a tentacle or a sensory antenna, radically different to the screen-based technology to which we are so accustomed. Their limbs now resemble hunting tentacles more than they appear human, sensing themselves through the air of invisible formations. Because <laughs> the invisible sculptures bend and twist in three dimensions, and hands and arms of the visitor have to twist, turn, bend, reach, move, search, and sense to be able to trace the invisible structures with their devices. Formations can also appear and grow within the body of the visitor. Example of voice and headphones. Something is forming within your chest. Place the screen of your device directly against your heart and listen. The chimera uses the body and rhythm of the visitor to transmit herself into the environment. The balance between symbiosis competition and parasitism is fragile. After some time, the visitor might gradually start to shift their perception of things. The visitor embodies potential forms of experience of other entities. For example, a bee is able to sense electrical fields around flowers and the visitor might locate an electrical field around the streetlight. A bat is reaching out to the world in total darkness by using echolocation, and the visitor might start to sense the movement of water below the ground, or be able to perceive the inside of the streetlight itself, or perceive the moving heart at the inside of their body. A moth can detect sound waves through its feet, and the visitor might start to be able to hear sound below their feet by placing their device directly onto the ground. In other words, we need new technologies for new senses to form new umbas. Yeah, okay. And, and and with new technologies, we don't mean that the new technologies will have a like a like a technology fix to get us that, but I think it's a it's like in a way in, in the philosopher uh, Yukui is talking about uh, techno diversity and 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 the, his way of talking about new technologies like not new variations you know like of technology but but a new uh, even a new perception of technology itself what is it and and what is laying behind it what do we want from it um, so in a way slightly non Western or like something else that is framing the technology that we use. I think this is the type of question I think we have with this project because, and I think that maybe is our reason that we want to work with this type of technology, which is the smartphone. And also maybe like the latest project now that we were, we are just about to begin exploring is kind of looking into other umwelts of, uh, um, other worlds of uh, animals, looking into different type of senses, animal senses and, uh, uh, very different ways of perceiving the world, like, for example, the bee being able to sense electrical fields, um, or the moth uh, being able to hear through its feet, for example. Uh, and um, also something that I was not mentioning yeah. here, which I find very interesting, but I would like to explore in this project is that um, that fish uh, experience in the oh, water, yeah. the vibration, so, so that they, so it's important in the evolution of sort of like uh, animals underwater to distinguish between them movement that they did themselves and movement that um, was caused by something that was not them. So uh, if we would not have that, I mean, this this is the same sort of thing that we still have, like we have the, the, the brain have to calculate what is my movement and what is the movement of something else around me, right? Because yeah. I, this is like how I differentiate my, between me and my surrounding. But it's something interesting when you work with technology in art in this way, there you can sort of temporarily sort of displace maybe the sense of that maybe I feel that um, I'm not sure anymore if I was moving or or, the, or something outside of me is moving and I'm something yeah. that I would like to make this piece even though it is for vis single visitors that are coming in mm -hmm. that there is uh, some element of the piece that actually connects people that is like I'm here on this street light and this is someone else away there is some kind of wave communication that we experience in sound or with the light somehow yes. almost like a like a signaling kind of 
Thank you. And we've been inspired, I mean, we could talk about it during the questions, but we've been inspired by a lot of different uh, authors. One book uh, is called Other Minds and also Metazoa by Peter Goldfrey Smith. Uh, that we were being very inspired by in relationship to this project. And also, like you said, Yukui. Uh, it's a media philosopher. Yeah, and also Merlin Sheldrake is a biologist, and he wrote a book called Entangled Life, which is specifically looking into fungi. Uh, but the list is long of different... Uh, um, at the moment, I'm reading the philosophy of the human voice and sonic agency, but we could kind of talk about talk about that soon, but maybe I feel we've been a bit lengthy now. <laughs> it's maybe time to... Yeah, it's hard to what uh, do you think? know the right timing when you're <laughs> so, so separate. <laughs> no, thank you very much. That was, that was, a, it was great timing. We started a bit late, so don't, so don't worry at all about that. It's great to, to hear about your work and it's a really impressive body of practice that you have. You have a lot of projects all exploring different things and um, yeah, like I personally like the appropriation of the kind of everyday technology um, in, in in new ways, like new new ways that make people think uh, differently about technologies that maybe are very apparent or normal for them. Mm. Um, and I have um, I know Yasek has a question, but I'll ask a question first. And, and there's also some questions from the from the audience. Um, but my my question is about kind of you're talking here about kind of non-human and the different you know different cultures and um and i i think that there are also you know different cultures obviously within within humankind and even presenting the same kind of work can have very different responses in very different places um and i, I you know kind of experienced this recently with a with the show i had in, in marseille where i am at the moment and uh like the people there deal, dealt you know interacted with the work in a completely different way than they did in in northern europe where i'd showed a similar similar kind of work before and I wondered about like, as your work kind of uh, has this kind of participatory, participatory element in, in, in some of it, how do, you, how do you deal with this when you're um, designing these mm. projects? Like how do, how do you expect yeah. people to work with the, with the technology and with the prompts and how obedient are they in different parts of the world? Yeah, that is a really interesting uh, point because yeah, it comes up to my mind now about showing in South Korea, so in the, an artwork called Elegy to the Medium of Film, where we had uh, in a way sampled quite a lot of um, no for Western audience known films like Solaris, Tarkovsky, and then uh, actually Twin Peaks with David Lynch uh, uh, and some other. Um, that is quite known for at least our generation of Western sort of audiences, but but they, I think, when they like the you know, because it's sort of that work was sort of like it, it goes from showing these um, sampled pieces of work, and then 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 the, then, the, then the cinema or like the saloon becomes dark, and the the film continues in the dark in a sense, and and you are led up from your seat into inside your imagined continuation or outside of the frame of the film, if you will. And, and um, what they described it, that they experienced was so different than, than, than I guess what we have uh, expected. And also they didn't have the same references. They, didn't, have a, they didn't, didn't really have a link to David Lynch in the same way, I think that many has with, with the Twin Peaks and all that. Um, but also it should be mentioned in, in Japan, the, the experience of time and and sound sensitivity and, sensitivity and, to and the and, amount of sound yeah and uh, yeah. Over, over like the overexposure of sound mm -hmm. that they described that they in when we developed the piece there like this was a part of like a symphony a version of symphony at one part when we tested things they said that the curators they said like, oh you know i feel that this is a maybe a bit overwhelming a bit too much and we, we had to be more minimalistic then we were. We really learned that then, kind of how to kind of steer that a bit. But then, of course, I mean, and not to be forgotten as well that uh, uh, within a culture there is, of course, a lot of variation as well. So, I mean, we've been showing the the work, for example, to blind people. We've been showing, you know, the, and I mean, there's always, I mean, people are neurodiverse, so there's different different kind of sensitivities. Absolutely. Um, but the, of course, there is like a when you come to a place like when we you saw, saw the video of uh, India, 
we worked specifically with local guys because we thought they would kind of know a little bit more uh, how to uh, how to touch because there were some things uh, that were more, a bit more sensitive. Um, but then at the same time, there was this. They were extremely brave. In uh, I think we never had uh, people collaborators as in India that were so like not scared at all to kind of pull the visitors through. Uh, so it, it, it's I mean it's very different from place to place. But I would also say that the variation is very great. Uh, within one context uh, itself as well. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. No. Thanks. Thanks very much. That's that's uh, very good. Uh, I know. Yes. Has a question, so I pass up to him now. Uh, yes. Thank you, Martina. Thank you, Christel. This was this was a really wonderful walk through uh, your amazing amazing evolution. Uh, I, I remember your, your early works and, and I'm, I'm following your work and it's really interesting to see how, I mean, in my opinion, that, that's actually my question. Uh, and I, I, I'm wondering if you will confirm my, my feeling that like your early works were very much uh, kind of inward oriented. I mean, they were very much about exploring the limits of human senses in a way, right? And uh, I experienced them as very much like a journey into the body. You are, you are, you are also talking a little bit at, at the beginning that uh, it is about uh, moving into into the depth of one's body and and the more recent projects the more uh, you seem to be interested in kind of opening up towards uh, understanding how the world around you is also sensing the presence of a human body is it something that i'm kind of uh, deducing it correctly that you are you're moving in, in a certain in a certain direction so, sorry no say say yeah 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 I think it, what was so you're asking in a way that kind of more starting off more like an in in world journey and then kind of now almost kind of looking out into the world in a different way. Yeah, exactly, exactly, and trying to to connect with with different way of sensing the world in a way. Like it, it feels like you reach the stage where you know the limits of human sensorium in a way, and now you're kind of trying to move beyond it in a way. Yeah. It's actually right. I mean, when we started the Symphony of Missing Room, it was it didn't even have it, it was actually called then my voice and I come from the other side of the room and it didn't have any architectural sounds. Um, it was just like a voice and a hand. So it, and it was very womb like like a womb that didn't have almost any nothing existed outside that bubble. And I think you're right, like step by step after that, we introduced kind of the outside world step by but there was nothing we, in a way we planned something that just in, uh, happened naturally and now yes we kind of uh, uh, into the um, umwelt of different animals we're very interested in that and that uh, is a very like um, strong inspiration so kind of we're reading a lot of um, biology books at the moment i, I was also thinking when krista you were mentioning the the philosopher the media philosopher you hi right mm. uh, uh, i was thinking of i think it was uh, benjamin bratton who was talking about how the technological evolution is not something distinct from the biological evolution that you know we, we kind of artificially try to pull them apart but they are in fact uh, you know very integral to each other and and in his view or in his world view uh, uh, we are the agents humans are the agents of the technological revolution which doesn't mean that other species that don't engage of course in you know technological developments mm -hmm. but we humans uh, are kind of pursuing this technological evolution in order to be able to understand or to provide knowledge to the to the planet to our planet so like our our role with the with technologies is to understand uh you know the history of the planet in a way but it's not the knowledge that is you know beneficial for us but it's ultimately supposed to be beneficial for the planet itself so in a way planet is you know like designed as humans and equipped us with the possibility to kind of evolve technologically in order to understand itself in a way. And that, that feeling I got when you were talking a little bit about the last uh, last project and, and also like by looking at the, the evolution of your project, that seems to be a, a pattern in a way, you know, like that you, you move, you start from, you know, like using technology to understand yourself mm. and you end up using technology to understand uh, all but yourself in a way, like yeah. all that surrounds you. you know? Yeah, yeah, it's, um, I mean, you know, like, 
we recently had a conversation with uh, Peter Godfrey Smith, the author of uh, Other Minds and Metasoa at Magazine 3 for this project Garden of Ghost Flowers. And one of the questions there from us, I think, was that what is the importance for him to meet other minds? Um, and, in, and, and in what, um, and if, we, um, if there is, um, or, or at the same time we asked this question, we also acknowledged the fact that, of course, um, when, I mean, then you're still, a, there's still a book written about that. So there's still a very human way of like, acquiring knowledge about other minds through reading and through language and concepts and so on. And, uh, and of course, that's the sort of science way, uh, because when you like, you know, you are uh, when you are making science and, and uh, looking at the world through science, you're also somehow looking at your own systems and so on. And the same with technology somehow. Um, and if you're learning about the world through technology, you're also learning it through uh, the sort of design that we or someone, some designer, some programmer have made a code decided the code from and and so on and, and they're also having an instrument in between you and the world and all that but um i'm thinking um maybe it's um especially with media technologies it becomes quite clear to me that the world is very much designed and into the bare like to, to the back end code that is written into the sort of environment that i experience when i'm in a digital space so there is almost like not only the space that I'm giving, there is almost the interpre interpretation of the space giving at the same time. So I'm not even like, when I relate it to the digital object, I'm not, not only like seeing the digital object, I'm also seeing the sort of like the, the way how I'm supposed to experience it somehow because of the context that it has been giving through the technology that created it. And I think that kind of um, very, like um, very narrow uh, or like sort of like, um, I don't know, like, and that's, I guess, but I'm sort of like, but I'm going towards Yuku's idea of techno diversity that you have in the same way as you, you have diversity in biology, you need it in technology too. You need to have uh, variations on technology, not only from driven by one type of industry, right? I mean, and that's why I think, I think when, when Yuku is connecting uh, technology to art, he's using painting quite often as a reference. But I, it could equally also be other types of project that create that that sort of like um, that um, or other mediums that that you're becoming aware of that oh this the way how this painting has been done makes uh, you see the world differently and that could be made with any type of technology equally, equally like with the sound art artwork and, and so on. Yeah, thank, thanks, Christer. Uh, we encourage everyone to to post questions if if you have any and there is one on the chat that has been posted by Hillary she's not with us anymore but I think it's a very interesting one so I will just re read it uh, out loud do people ever have a trauma response to this work and what sorts of supports do you put in place for that kind of reaction yeah yeah it has happened of course that when you work with people senses specifically when you're depriving uh, your sense of vision. I mean, a lot of people, they, uh, most people rely on the vision. And when you remove that, you feel out of control. So it's quite a common response that people can respond with fear. And then um, normally that is something that we work with. So we kind of notice that if someone is scared, we take it easy, we can feel it in their hand. It rarely goes to a moment where we actually have to stop. But uh, of course that has happened. I mean, I know myself, I mean, that we, um, Sometimes we do work in total darkness, and that is very different than if you have a white out goggles, you can take it off and you're out. But if you're in the dark, you're sort of more dependent on someone else to take you out. And sometimes if you, for example, have a panic attack, you need to be taken out straight away. I mean, that change needs to happen straight away. And I mean, I myself can have that in the work, so <laughs> I can totally relate to, to that. But it, though it's not so common, but when it has happened, uh, we um take care of the person individually because then the guy that is guiding the person is freed up so people might go you might go and take a coffee with the person and talk it through uh, and so you don't just end it kind of end it there um, for those works uh, so yeah 
uh, yeah, it, it can be tricky, but luckily it hasn't uh, happened uh, a lot. But I think it's important to be aware that this is uh, something that can be very uh, sensitive to people. And there always needs to be exit points uh, in the work itself. Like, no, you have to enter work. You cannot enter the work without knowing where the exit uh, exit point is, how to exit the work and how to stop it. And it's always fine to, and then sometimes, I mean, just to mention another thing, sometimes it's also, you have an unexpected response. You might think that you're not very sensitive and then you have an unexpected response. If, for example, we had once a pilot that got extremely scared of heights at um, at Dramat, and uh, we did a work at Dramat, and and, and it, you, you, when you do that work, you're being guided uh, very far above the theatre, and he suddenly had a strong reaction to heights, and that was unexpected um, in your pilot, but uh, it happened. <laughs> Great, thanks for clarifying that, uh, Martina. Yeah, well, we can pass that on to. Uh to the person, yeah, if, if, they, if they are in touch with us with Hillary. Um, thanks for that. So we have another question from Simon O'Brien, which is kind of similar to mine in a way. Where, uh, and they ask, um, they feel that the most significant ex uh, experimental trait involved in your work is the ability or willingness uh, of a participant to really give themselves to the work. Uh, the more you give to them, the more you get out of it. Mm -hmm. Uh, is it more rewarding for you and the participants to work with confident, engaged people? And if, and if so, what is the greatest barriers to people feeling comfortable enough to fully commit? So what is the last thing that they, what is the... Right? Sorry, yeah, so if, if, if they are um, confident and engaged people, um, how, how do you, what, what, what are the great, if they're not, sorry, uh, confident and engaged people, uh, what are the barriers to getting people comfortable enough to fully commit to the work? Mm. It's really, it's really kind of um, starts from the first moment you enter the place where the work is being shown. I think this is very so. How you're being taken care of, like even just things like how you're being instructed uh, where to place your bag. I mean, you're going to leave your bag behind for for some time and so you have just trust that this is taken care of so the the moment you enter the work or pre-entering the work that ritual needs to be very clear and structured and you need to be able to communicate um, trust um, so we very carefully select the people that are introducing the work mm. uh, for that reason because if that is broken yeah people and it's also a little bit in which context you are so if we are showing in a festival context and depending on the festival uh, it can actually really depend like how in which state people enter, but then you have to work um, work with that. But then again, I mean, this is kind of the context, of course, like you, you have to trust the institution, you have to trust all of the people that you meet, but but then inside the, the work, the reason I think that I, I mean, if I go towards myself, the reason why I would trust uh, and to be uh, open to explore within uh, or experience our work is when things sort of, <clears throat> doesn't feel to be arbitrary like that it that it's all that happens in the piece sort of um is coherent in some sense that it that it's really like a composition like it, if it feels off it's something that i feel i don't trust it somehow um um, and it can feel off, I guess, because I mean, like, you're not fully, you're also not in full control over, yeah. especially if you come with your own device, uh, your own mobile device. It can be like factors, uh, and very often actually happen that, you know, your battery is too low or uh, you haven't downloaded the app, mm. and that's kind of quite tricky sometimes. That that's actually the whole point. Actually, like the whole, like why I mean, the less control is <laughs> interesting because <laughs> we work with technology. And we're talking about you know like technology is like sort of like a sense of being in control of the world actually that is true all the way in the way how we experience like um like when we are in control though our work works the best when we are in a lot in control i think so far but then interestingly enough with pieces like unknown cloud um and also the garden of ghost flowers when you have uh, multiple like people um participating at the same time we are getting less and less control. And then we have to really think differently about our sort of like strategies in how we form the work and, and the sort of like interaction between people. Because if you cannot always be in control, we have to base this sort of uh, trust into something else. 
because if you know like if 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 coherency and and if something is like in the right composition and so on, if that is what makes people trust, yes. If things then breaks because we are not in control of, of how people will interact and how, how technology behave, then we are that and that actually what we have experienced now lately. Yeah. That there and, is a... and which is interesting. I mean, because one of the inspirations for the one of the collective works that we do is the, the sociologist Hartmut Rosa. And he talks about uh, the concept of resonance. And resonance is something it's he described it as a way of listening adapting and responding rather than commanding controlling and calculating uh, and you can apply that to a discussion so how and you can basically think of it as how can i allow myself to be changed by something but still maintaining my integrity uh, in that way, I would be less scared of what is different for me because I'm still allowed to be changed by it, but I still know who I am in mm. the equation. Uh, and but then he also mentions that resonance is also something when we expect too much resonance, it's a way of relating to the world. You kind of something responds back to you, but if you expect it too much, it's almost a little bit break uh, breaks a little bit that it's almost like you you know you're going for your holiday and you have a lot of expectations and you want to have a good time and then you end up maybe not feeling that at all so it's also to do with that expectation of having something responding back to you when that becomes too much of an obsession as well but resonance was actually an inspiration because the latest collective work is a work where you use your voice uh, collectively and you use your non-linguistic voice and you listen, adapt and respond to each other in that work. Uh, so I, I thought he would be an interesting example in, in relationship to that question. Mm -hmm. can, can I ask one more question? I, I'm, I'm very curious about, uh, I mean, it feels like with this, this level of complexity on many levels, like you have the technical complexity, you have the conceptual complexity, yeah. you have kind of ontological co complexity where you try to really like play with different worldviews, you know, kind of infuse your work with different worldviews. It almost feels like there, there is a need for the for the participants to either have like a kind of a transitory ritual that would lead into the, into your world first, or mm. perhaps uh, a, a possibility to experience it several times to really start getting mm. the uh, you know the flow of your work, and I wonder if 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 you experience something like that, people returning and and, mm -hmm. and fe feeling like the first time when they experience your thing was more like being fe a feeling of being dropped into a deep ocean and and w without necessarily feeling any uh, any benefits or any any pleasure or any uh, anything not not necessarily get, getting anything out of it, and only after the second or third time, just like with swimming, you know, you, you started kind of getting it and and mm -hmm. and taking something out of it. In, in other words, uh, the the technical and this conceptual uh, complexity, th th do you find it as a barrier for people to uh, to engage? And is is it a little bit like a uh, those aspects? Aren't they a little bit like gatekeepers uh, that they would basically see if the, the those who who wouldn't like to try again and 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 those who would like to try again would stay and mm. and keep engaging in your work in a way. I think um, it, it, I would respond like it, it's um, in different ways I can respond to that because in I mean in our later works with the garden of ghost flowers, for example, I feel that because that that sort of like the system that we work with, the technology we work with is so unstable that we cannot always con control what experience people have. For that work, I think it's really beneficial for people to sort of get um, understanding the work behind this project uh, and what it is actually that is going on behind uh, in in the in tech in tech wise in a way because in, in what they are doing actually with their voices when they um, listening and respond and call out to each other with different uh, tones and, and volumes and so on they are actually triggering a really complex like back-end programming system that is actually uh, growing a what we call a ghost flower depending on what they what they how they respond to each other and and i think when we tested this now in uh, in in stripe in in eindhoven i think it was not so clear to everyone only in the last room where they came out when they could actually see more clearly this um ghost this this digital entity that was growing out of their voices 
then some people that have missed that inside the inside the Virgogos, they understood what what have happened basically. And then some people did come back because it's a piece which is you. It's really about the interaction uh, between people, and you only see what you create with your voice. So if you create the visuals with your voice, you only see what. If you don't use your voice, I mean, some people came out uh, said it doesn't work. The headset doesn't work. And that was actually because they didn't use their voice. So there's nothing then. If they, they were giving them instructions, but yeah. sometimes you you sort of have expectations that you would not you anyway, sort of like, uh, yeah. And uh, yeah, no, it's... Um... Yeah, that's it. And then sometimes also people do get this really sense of resonance that I spoke of before. Like you, you, you have this strong connection with someone. You don't know maybe who they are, but you respond to each other's voices. And then you want to come back and you want to have that again and you second time you might not get that at all mm. so it's also the other way around like uh, and then also like you say as well that it's sometimes you need a few times before you sort of are able to process everything okay now I accept it that I need to use my voice I'm psychologically mm. prepared and then so it, it can work I guess both ways I, I would yeah. say that our previous work like Symphony of a Missing Room I think it was more often the case that people had a very like a strong maybe yeah really strong encounter in the in the first time they experienced that work and then maybe when they came into the second time maybe they did expected too much of it and maybe they didn't have the same but I think with eternal like the the, the, the garden of ghost flowers this new work mm -hmm. with the voice because it's so complex and like if you're in the wrong place in the room or maybe in the wrong group you might have a like a not not as good like a not an interesting experience but then you come back and then it's everything is different and then you do have that so I think that work is the type of format which actually allow for going deeper and deeper in it the more I and I for me too actually I was there like throughout the whole festival and, and inside the piece and the more I was there I was not getting bored of it so I realized that this is the sort of the, the value of that type of work, which you can actually explore more and more and more. You don't understand where it ends. And also the script, normally we use pre-recorded voice, but this was a live voice because we were like, we, we really don't know like how we're going to make this work. So we thought that, okay, let's have the improvise, have a script, which is partially set and partially improvised so we can respond live to the group. And we are very happy that we did that because um, otherwise we would have been lost, much more lost than we we were so yeah this big pile of messy script like changing back and forth from every performance that we made <laughs> wonderful uh, there's uh, there's some comments uh, and words of appreciation from simon uh, i wish i'd gone through it at least twice once was certainly <laughs> not enough uh, mm -hmm. But uh, I think Kathleen is asking about the, the book, the resonance book. Uh, oh, yeah. Martina, you mentioned uh, who, who is the author of it? Uh, Hartmut uh, Rosa. Hart He's, Hartmut. Yeah. Hartmut Rosa. He's a sociologist. So right. he, the book is called Resonance. And then he wrote another book uh, recently, which is called The Uncontrollability of the World as well. Mm -hmm. And I think another book before that was it? called acceleration yeah. because he basically he felt that people uh, misunderstood him of being um against acceleration but in a way he wasn't uh, for him the problem with acceleration uh, an accelerating society is that society becomes mute in relationship in your relationship to it so um, nothing responds back to you anymore. So, so it's not, he, he just meant that uh, the opposite of acceleration isn't deacceleration, but more, yeah, he said, right. it's more rather resonance. Yeah. Can I ask you one question about uh, the significance of failure in your work? Hmm. Uh, because again, I mean, it, it, <laughs> it, it looks like you have it under control. Uh, no, 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 no. But, no, no, but it is specifically I, I, true in the yeah, last. I mean, I mean, it, it looks like, but I, I bet, you know, someone who also works with technology and sound working, I know that there is always friction, there's always, there are always glitches from which you can learn. And I, I wonder what is your experience when it comes this to is, learning uh, from failing? It's so good at failing. Yeah, no, no, no. I mean, I mean, uh, increasingly so. And now yeah. towards a degree that it becomes like almost, like how to say, like almost impossible not to accept 
I mean, like that to, to totally re, re, re to, to think differently about what it is that you're doing because it doesn't work. Because the more of technology you work with, the, the, the less in control you are. And therefore, we felt with the latest project that we, we have to totally yeah. uh, create, recreate the context in which people go into the work and not thinking about it as a finished piece, but there's more like an encounter with technology and with uh, other people through that technology. And, and then that uh, it may not always be, it's not a VR experience that you go in, it's always the same, for sure not. Um, but also because it's programmatic and we don't program, I and mean, we have our collaborators, Anto Garden, which are also co-artists, pro, uh, pro, programmers and co-artists, and uh, they program in Unity. And we don't fully know our, it's, like, it's almost like not fully knowing your tools. And I made the description to, Christy ones that it's really like this the process for this particular project that is more recent is a bit like being a blind sculptural so you're going to a studio and it's totally dark and then the light comes on and you see the sculpture and then the light goes off directly and then you have to instruct someone else <laughs> which is now probably the programmer like now you're going to do up and, and he's and the programmer says no but I don't know what is up what do you mean upside like <laughs> you don't have even have a language to share and then the light comes on and it's totally different like what is it's nothing is and then you have to start again and, we, and so that and then it goes dark and that it's all it's been like that all the time and even during the time when we've been performing it like suddenly things in the headset is changing now everything is all the voices are raining down why are they doing that it's beautiful but i don't understand why they're doing that now and then it can be something like the group is behaving differently or um, the uh, uh, death rate of the voice because the voice that you externalize into the virtual space has a has a death rate or survival rate and you need to feed it with your voice for it to survive longer so it can be that this needs to be adjusted and but then if you always, sometimes also you can over overpower the computer system and then it sort of like uh, it crashes. crashes or like so it's like this kind of balance all the time yes and before we even understood that like how so not really un uh, no uh, understanding the tool so now i'm going to definitely uh go uh, just to go course in unity to not to maybe do it myself but just to be able to understand at least understand a little bit more the tool uh that we are using i think that would be good <laughs> like our our shared friend ronald jones used to say quoting somewhere back at fail again fail better right oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you said, i love that yeah. <laughs> you see permission exactly <laughs> uh, well i don't see any more questions on the chat but if anyone would like to just jump in and without writing i think we we might have room for one more Perhaps it's already half a little bit more than half past seven. So I guess we are about to conclude. Are there any more questions? I don't think so, but if not, then oh, there is one that just popped up. Uh, let's see, or maybe it's, it's a comment. I can just read it out. Uh, much of your work involves an interpreter or guide to assist the participants. Is this always a given in the development or are there are there pieces which don't require this and are self-guided? I think you touched upon it a, bit, a little bit. Uh, what do you think would be lost and gained by developing a piece that didn't need any guidance? Hmm. Yes, actually, so uh, one of the pieces that we shown, uh, one was called Involution at Uppsala Kunst Museum. And this piece was in particular between two visitors. So you do it together with someone else, which is very different like than if we are being guides to a visitor. So in a way you're placed on the same hierarchy because you, you do the work together with someone that knows as little as you about the work. Still, um, there is, of course, um, a voice that is giving choreographical instructions or sort of like, in a way, guides you through your perception in a sense. But yeah, I mean, it would be almost like a totally new practice if we would uh, 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 go away from those instructions somehow. I mean, it would be uh, very hard even for me to think about a like a work like that, right? What was when was the last one actually? But I don't think we have ever made a piece so, without but, any but voice. You, okay, so you mean without any voice? Yeah, without any voice. Yeah. Oh, um, you know the choreographic stage pieces from two thousand and five. But this is your work. <laughs> this, is, this is your work, dear. <laughs> <laughs> so a long time ago, but, but okay. Um, yeah. 
Well, maybe we're forgetting something. Maybe we did do something. Yeah, no, no. My God, we haven't. No, no, no. <laughs> maybe, maybe in one of your next pieces you can include a non-human guide, for instance. You know, that's uh, that's but... um, that's um, but that's the thing, though, because I mean, guide. Yes, of course, you can do that in different ways, but you somehow always need some kind of understandable. I mean, we tried to do that in a way with the speed reading thing that you saw in the evolution go away from a voice to have a text that is uh, giving some sense of guidance there was like a text that flickered through yeah there was a part of the guidance in in that piece was yeah. just the text instead of like having the voice yeah and it's very strange when you have it written very fast because it's almost like it, it almost penetrates your brain in a, in a in a different way you can't objectify it when it, you you're not in control over the reading speed of it mm -hmm. Yeah, or maybe yeah, but you maybe we should do something. A guide dog, Kathleen is suggesting. Was that a guide dog? A oh wow, Kathleen. that would be beautiful. Yeah. yeah, that would be really beautiful. Yeah. All right, thank you so much, Martina. Thank you, Krista. This was amazing, and I, I guess we could sit here and and talk for another hour or two, probably. Mm -hmm. uh, when is the next occasion to see your piece in real life? It's actually in uh, Kassel in uh, during Documenta. There is a project um, by the Kassel Stadstheater, which is um, I think it's called uh, hist um, hi uh, what is it? There's something about histories, like. Um, uh, I'm too tired, but uh, but uh, either, either way, we are. Uh, it's like a sort of like a program where alternative histories, I think something to do with alternative histories. Mm -hmm. And it's basically an opera piece that is running for three weeks, but there's also um, an exhibition program along, running alongside that. But it's the, in, 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 in all, all in all, it's sort of um, um, an art project, which is attempting to find a new connection towards um, nature and also to the human and, and to technology. So it's very, uh, suiting for where we are in our practice but we are going to show symphony um but in a different way relating to that um, sort of framework and we're going to be at uh, i yeah. mean this is far away as well but it's in mit media lab in mm -hmm. in the autumn so mm -hmm. that looking forward to 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 be there i mean we exist uh um, I think the last few years we've been in the film world as well with our VR pieces so I think in good and bad ways, we are existing in between different disciplines. So we've been both in choreography, in theater, in the arts, and now in the film. Uh, I think the only category which we haven't really been in is music. No, we have been in the music as well. You know, when we did Steinman Sounds in London. So yeah, so we in between, we're mm -hmm. a bit homeless. Yeah. <laughs> in terms of, uh... in intentionally homeless. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, great, yeah. Uh... MIT sounds amazing, and I, I will be there in the autumn as well in Boston. So let's try to find. Oh, a really? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> let's do that. Yeah, 